So welcome everyone. Today we have a very special colloquium because it will start with a public oath of Piotr Waluk. Piotr Waluk is also our speaker today. He's, uh, well, he was very involved in many things, starting from being a representative of our running team in CFT. Uh, also, he's known popularizer. He was organizing science festival uh, in CFT. He was also very involved in organizing uh, Olympic Games in physics in Poland. And despite so many duties, he managed to, to finish uh, his PhD, which was very, very good, and he received a distinction. But there is tradition in Poland that before receiving finally this PhD, you should also declare that you agree with some important ethical values. And for that is this oath, which uh, will now uh, have with uh, Piotr Waluk and a supervisor. <clears throat> so the tradition is that the supervisor is uh, reading the text of this oath and then uh, our PhD student can swear. Then we have to sign some documents and then we start our colloquium. So I propose that we'll start, but because this is important even, uh, event, everyone has to stand up. Also people in front of the screens. <laughs> so Professor Kijowski, now it's your turn. So we continue this very long tradition. Uh, although during the first 650 years of the history of universities in Poland, it was always in Latin language, but now we switch to Polish. Szanowny doktorancie, stajesz dziś przed nami, by po przedstawieniu rozprawy i zdania uniu egzaminów w których wykazałeś wymagany poziom wiedzy i umiejętności, uzyskać stopień doktora nauk fizycznych. Przyrzeknij zatem, że wiedzę swą tu zdobytą wykorzystywać będziesz zawsze dla poznania prawdy. Prawdę tę będziesz głosił i nią kierował się w życiu. Przyrzeknij także, że zawsze będziesz wytrwale pracował dla rozwoju nauki a jej wyników będziesz używał nie dla niegodnych zysków i próżnej sławy, lecz dla dobra powszechnego. Przyrzeknij również, że swym zachowaniem nie splamisz tej godności, którą ci mamy nadać. Czy przyrzekasz? Przyrzekam. Now we have to sign official documents. I propose that first supervisor will sign here. Then the head of our research council, Professor Lech Mankiewicz. So now, PhD the student, so Piotr, please, here's a place for you. Uh, yes. And me, on behalf of the director of CFT at the end. So, congratulations. <laughs> and now we can start the standard part because Piotr Waluk finally decided to change the subject from uh, gravitation to money, as we see. So now he is working uh, for Citibank and he explained us what he was doing during his PhD and what he's doing now and maybe if these two things are somehow connected. Okay, please. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, so yeah, uh, the title of my talk today is Space, Time and Money. <laughs> uh, and the talk will actually have be split in two parts. In the first one, I will try to explain uh, a bit about the stuff I did uh, during my PhD, my research uh, and my thesis. Uh, and in the second part, I will share with you uh, some well, reflections, thoughts <laughs> uh, about, uh, well, things I did after my PhD and uh, my employment in the financial industry. Uh, but going back to the first point, uh, the general topic of my PhD uh, was the uh, was quasi-local mass or quasi-local energy of gravity. Uh, so I will start by well, explaining what is the problem with energy and gravity and why is it such a, well, it's actually a hard topic and a, a still open problem. Unfortunately, didn't manage to solve it all yet. Yes, uh, just I will talk about ways that we try to, to deal with the problem of defining energy uh, of the gravitational field. What can we actually do in that regard? What we can't do and, and why actually, well, yeah, why does it still remain an open problem? The issue is a bit understood uh, in the regime of uh, linearized gravity just in the approximated Einstein theory. So I will briefly describe that and show how this linearized gravity, um, just our understanding of energy of linearized gravity can be used as a criterion to somehow gauge sensibility of our efforts uh, to define the notion of uh, energy in full nonlinear theory of gravity. And uh, Yes, and in the second part, uh, just I will talk a bit about my current job, uh, which actually uh, is cons yeah, mostly consists of assisting the process of uh, uh, the bank fulfilling its uh, regulatory obligations. But more about that when we get to that part. But first, energy. So why do we care so much about the notion of energy? Uh, obviously, the first time when we hear about energy, like in, well, right now it's in primary school, the education system change, changes a lot, but when we first hear about it, we hear about it as a first integral of uh, evolution of a system. Just energy is conserved in an evolving system, that's what we hear. I mean, the, the term first integral comes... I mean, and, and no one calls... <laughs> No one calls it directly a first integral, of course, but when, when a teacher says energy is conserved in the interactions, what he actually means is that it is a first integral, <laughs> of course, yes, but, and I could think of, I mean, probably statistically there must have been some teacher who tried that, <laughs> I mean, uh, yes, uh, then uh, well, as a first integral, the notion of energy uh, is can naturally help us in analyzing some complicated system, because if it is conserved, it already gives us some information of how interactions can uh, evolve. Uh, also, uh, it can serve as a simplifying method uh, for analyzing very complicated system, which consists perhaps of parts very differing in nature. Uh, for example, if we talk about the interaction of electromagnetic field with let's say just some matter, some matter particles, stuff like that. Uh, we don't necessarily always have to, to, to dig into all the details of how the interaction occurs, but still if we know that, well, there's this, we have, we, if we have this notion of energy and we know that it is conserved, then we can already say that, well, it doesn't really matter how this electromagnetic field interacts with this particle. We know that it can do some things, maybe, and we can know for sure that it can't do some other things. Mm. Then going on into well, even more abstract views, uh, energy serves as a generating function uh, if we mm, just uh, use the variational description of mechanics. In the Hamiltonian picture, uh, 
the, the Hamilton function, Hamiltonian function H, uh, well, generates the time derivatives of the generalized positions and momenta just by, by such a simple set of equations. Uh, and finally, uh, in just, well, and finally, as yes, one more use of the notion of energy, it can serve as a measure of, uh, well, how far a system that we're examining is from some kind of base state, whether we can, we can say whether a system is uh, perhaps somehow excited or not, just by measuring its energy. And also, uh, just this knowing this this measure from the base state we can also um, learn some things about perhaps stability of the system whether the system can actually somehow undergo um, a big change over time go out of some well of potential things like that so energy is important and what what's more we know that gravity field carries energy. Uh, this fact is well established, and uh, actually there have been several Nobel, Nobel Prizes awarded for that fact. Uh, actually, the first uh, proof of existence of gravitational waves uh, in 1993 was performed by, by precise observations of two stars uh, circling each other and showing that, these, that this energy the, the, the kinetic energy of these two stars somehow gets dissipated in an unknown way. And this unknown way, the only explanation, because you know, we could measure just the, 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 the electromagnetic uh, radiation, we could measure perhaps look at some other gravitational at some just interactions with other things. And these, the, the, these two stars were obviously losing energy while rotating, and the only explanation for that is that we're actually radiating this energy by means of gravitational waves. So that's how we first learned yeah, for sure that gravitational waves exist. And then actually, and what, not only they exist, but they actually can carry energy with them. And then, uh, well, in 2017, people finally managed to, to, to perform a direct measurement of the gravitational waves. And then, well, So maybe this is what uh, help everyone is su suspected gravitational waves in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good comment. Thank you. Just uh, about this dissipation of energy of binary systems. Yeah, not only do we not know where the, the, the stars are somehow misplacing their energy, but it actually turned out that the, that the predictions of the Einstein's theory about how much energy should be radiated in the gravitational waves exactly explained the missing energy from the system. Thank you for that comment. Right, and uh, going back to, 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 to the recent results also, uh, they, there are ways Penrose proposed actually a way in which we can extract energy uh, from the gravitational field. In the case of the Penrose process, we were talking about the gravitational field in the form of a black hole, of a rotating black hole. So we can actually, by somehow shooting particles in, a, in an appropriate way at a rotating black hole, we can actually extract energy from, that, from it. Ergo, it, it must have some energy to begin with that we can extract. And, well, Penrose received, also received the Nobel Prize for his general achievements <laughs> in black hole research. So once we know that gravity does carry energy, a natural question is um, how much energy does it carry? I mean, how much? Yes, uh, how, well, for example, if we're extracting this energy from a black hole, how much energy we can extract? Uh, in the case, okay, that's perhaps a bad example, because in the case of the Penrose process, there is actually a relatively well understood limit for the amount of energy uh, that can be taken from a black hole, but a black hole is a rel relatively simple uh, 
simple solution to the Einstein equations. And uh, when we're looking at, for example, just an area of space with, uh, with some gravitational waves in it, and we would like to ask how much energy is contained in that area of space in these gravitational waves. So, or, well, just, just to, to, to compare with this, uh, yeah, to, to compare with the electromagnetic field, if we just look at a given point, we have a precise instrument, we can measure the electric and magnetic field at a given point, and then we can calculate the density of electromagnetic energy at that point. We would like to do the same with the gravitational field, but unfortunately, we are not able to. Uh, it turns out that gravity does not contain, uh, that does not possess uh, a well-defined notion of uh, energy density. And uh, this comes from the geometric nature of gravity. Uh, well, in Einstein theory, gravitational interaction is, uh, well, modeled in such a way that uh, simply uh, free particles that do not undergo any other interactions are supposed just to move on, on ge geodesic lines. And uh, the presence of mass distorts the space-time and therefore distorts the shape of the geodesics on which free particles move. So in fact, uh, uh, gen uh, so in fact, gravity is not a force by itself. It is uh, actually a choice of a reference frame. It is just a, it's simply, yes. So, so, oh yeah, this statement is perhaps best explained by this equivalence princi the principle that the local effects of motion uh, in a curved space-time are indistinguishable uh, from those of an accelerated observer. So it's a property of a space-time rather than a force. Right? Yes, it's, it's a property of a space-time. It's a shape of a space-time <laughs> rather than a force. And uh, it so happens that this is, well, the, this shape of the geodesic uh, of a geodesic curve uh, in a four-dimensional space-time is just given by this geodesic equation. The problem with this equation is that those coefficients here depend both of the met on the metric and on the uh, coordinate derivatives of the metric. That, that these are not tensorial objects. So if we change uh, the coordinate uh just the coordinates in which we look in which we just describe objects in the space time we may choose them in such a way uh, that these geodesics will locally just uh, look just similar uh, to uh to, to straight lines in the minkowski space so we can always find such a frame of reference in which these coefficients vanish and we obtain just a a simple equation of a free particle that's just the second uh, derivative of the motion is, uh, of, of the position is equal to, to zero. And uh, again, that means that just at a given point, uh, we can only always move to a, well, one could say non inertial frame of reference, but Actually, just the, the problem with curved space-time is that we cannot actually distinguish the inertial from non-inertial frames of reference. We can always find such a frame of reference that, at least at a point, the, the whole interaction, the, the whole force of gravity vanishes. And just using this uh, analogy to the electromagnetic uh, field, in the electromagnetic field, the energy is usually defined as a square of the field strength times some, some coefficient. But if we would like to do the same thing for gravity, then again, this, this field strength at a point always vanishes. So we can always set the, the density of energy of gravity to zero. And uh, if we would, I mean, one would think, okay, but gravity is somehow this curvature of space and curvature of space, space time is, uh, is, at, is a tensorial object is well defined at a point. I mean, well, although it, we can give just this mathematical description, the value of a tensor at a point that defines 
this curvature of uh, space time, but uh, we cannot actually measure it at a point. So there's, is ju there's just, oh, if you look at this line, could you tell me is this line straight or not? Mm -hmm. uh, it looks straight, but it is actually an arc <laughs> of a very, very, very big, cir big circle. But just looking at a, this, well, part that's yeah, almost like a point <laughs> if we're in, in relation to the radius of the circle, we cannot actually determine uh, whether this line is straight or not. I mean, to be able to determine that, we need to, to, to have some extended part. To, to, we need to examine some extended part of the line. I mean, that, so again, curvature is a non-local object, although it has value at a point, but to determine this value at a point, we need to examine the space-time in our vicinity. We just need some finite amount of space-time to look at to actually determine whether it's curved or not. So again, it's not well defined at a... Excuse me. Derivative, just derivative, mathematical derivative. Is it local quantity or it's unlocked? Yes. I mean, gradient. You mean gradient? Yes. Yes. So. Yeah. But if you have derivative, if you have derivative in your Hamiltonian, then the only derivative which depends on on some point, then the theory is called local theory. Right? So everything is unlocal. I mean, okay, let us agree that the value of the metric and its first derivatives are not sufficient. You have to go to second derivative, which means that we must compare. Uh, <laughs> neighboring point. Okay. Yes. And uh, well, anyway, that's just a more of a hand waving explanation to look at a more sophisticated approach <laughs> in the variational form formulation of uh, general relativity. Uh, we, well, meet two objects which, well, in other theories are often regarded as this energy densities. And those are the stress energy tensors. Uh, one is the canonical uh, stress energy tensor, which is obtained uh, by from the Noether's theorem. And the other one is the so-called symmetric energy tensor, which is obtained from, uh, well, by just differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to the metric. Uh, so in matter theories, we can use these things to, 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 to usually define the stress energy of the field. But in gravitational theory, we encounter some problems. Uh, this canonical mm, stress energy tensor turns out to be gauge dependent. Uh, and this gauge that I'm talking about here is just the, this choice of the coordinate, uh, coordinate system in which we're performing on our calculations. So uh, since this since this depends on the coordinate frame, it is not a tensorial object, actually. And uh, we can also always just choose such a reference frame for which the, the canonical uh, stress energy, well, I'm not really tensor in that, in that regard, will just simply uh, be equal to zero. And then the problem of the symmetric energy tensor is that if we uh, just try to differentiate the, the Lagrangian of gravity with respect to to this metric, uh, it, uh, it just gives us the field equations of gravity. Because this expression here, it is actually, well, it is applicable to, to matter theories, to theories that are just a fields that are evolving in some, on some, well, in some space time, on some background. And uh, so here we're actually differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to the background on which the field evolves. And in case of gravity, uh, this tensor G, the metric, is actually the field itself. Uh, so we're not uh, gaining anything new here, right? That, that these are just 
that's just a normal derivation of, of the field equations. Uh, and also actually just this, this notion of the symmetric stress energy tensor comes actually from uh, uh, general relativity in which we, when we actually try to, to model gravitation with interacting with some matter fields, then we just need to sum the Lagrangians of gravitation and of the matter fields. And then after differentiating the whole sum with respect to the metric, we obtain that just the field equations of gravity have this stress and energy of the matter fields in it as a source. So in the end, there is no such thing as a stress energy tensor or a local energy density for a gravitational field. So the second fact simply means that that if you would like to consider uh, symmetric uh, stress energy tensor definition for classical configuration as field equations are fulfilled the result will be zero right uh, yes just the, the, the result would be zero if we have no matter fields yes in this way right uh, just it would simply vanish by by means of the field equation <laughs> Okay, uh, so we don't have a notion of uh, local energy density, but uh, what can we do to, to action? But, but we, I mean, we know that gravity does contain energy, so how can we try to measure it? If we can't measure it locally, the natural next step to try will be just to try to measure it in some region. Uh, this is, well, when we're measuring it some region, this is usually referred to as quasi-local uh, energy density. And uh, to, 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 to actually give uh, some sense to these considerations, uh, it is, we should actually just state perhaps right now that we're, we'll be thinking for, about energy as this generating function uh, for time evolution of a gravitating system. So to define this energy, we actually need also to, to, to define this evolution of the gravitating system. Uh, so to do that, first we need to start with a system. <laughs> That's quite simple. Uh, so um, this would and uh, just, this would mean that we'll need just to choose some slice, some space-like slice of the space-time. Well, the choice of the slice is kind of arbitrary since there is no such thing as an absolute uh, definition of now uh, in the in general relativity. And uh, if we don't want to, to talk about the whole space-time, uh, so we just need to isolate our system by means of some boundary. So we just we take some three just so on this space space like slice that's a three dimensional uh, manifold we just choose a region which is uh, just uh, well, bounded by this by two dimensional boundary surface. Next to know how a system evolves, uh, we need uh, to we need to know. Uh, how it interacts with the outside world, right? Just if you think about, yeah, so, so if you forgot, for example, <laughs> uh, so think about an example from uh, thermodynamics. Uh, if you just have a box with a gas in it, this gas inside the box will evolve in a different way depending on whether you allow this, this box to transfer temperature or just to just to 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 to, to I mean sorry to transfer temperature to, to to exchange energy or whether it for example you will totally isolate this system from the outside and uh, then the last part that we need and that's actually well a uh, kind of a new thing com when I'm comparing to, to to normal math and just field theories we actually need to define time because there is no canonical choice of, of a time direction in general relativity. So we also need to somehow make a choice here. Uh, so let's, so the general picture of what we need looks more or less like that. We have this, this blue circle is, uh, is just this three-dimensional uh, bounded region 
expand space-like region in space-time. Uh, this then uh, on this that then we have this 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 tube when we move our region in the space-like direction. So so this tube somehow tells us how the time evolution for the for the system looks. And then if we're talking about interactions, uh, we're talking about interactions of the gravitational field. So actually, but the gravitational field is the shape of the manifold. So just the shape of this boundary of the gravitating system also contains information about interactions. So I mean, the, the, yeah, this shape or perhaps some, some, <clears throat> some conditions that we impo impose on it. And uh, so if we have uh, such, uh, well, so we have some, a well-defined system and now we would like to, 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 to measure this energy of the system. But as I said, uh, just the, the, the notion of, well, right, one's the direction of time, but also the notion of simultaneity of time is, well, it doesn't really, uh, I mean, it's not well defined in, uh, in general relativity. So if we have this extended region, we could actually think about moving, just taking some small part in the interior of the system and perhaps pushing it a bit forward in time or perhaps pushing it a bit backward in time. Just letting it evolve for a bit, but without moving this, uh, this, this boundary. Well, uh, since we would so and that so such operation should not actually alter uh, the amount of energy uh, just that such a system contains because we obviously want this this energy of the system to be conserved and since we're only moving a bit in the interior so no interaction with the outside actually took place so so to actually to, to, for, for that to be fulfilled it makes sense to to just uh, assign energy just to, to somehow this boundary surface just and, and say that the energy of all the possible three-dimensional surfaces that span this two-dimensional boundary is actually the same so we'll just assign energy to this to this d sigma and uh, this approach actually uh found some success just understanding this gravitational just just defining gravitational energy by some boundary integral I found much success in the form of the Arnovit Desser and Misner mass definition of the gravitational system uh, that's the definition of well that that's the definition of a mass of an isolated gravitating system that means that uh, just well the field and whatever sources of the field they are they're just concentrated in a finite region of space and far from far away from that source uh, the space time look looks almost like flat minkowski space so uh, when we make just then when we just perform an integral over this mm -hmm. very over this boundary surface around this gravitating system and uh, send this boundary to infinity uh, just to, to the part when the space-time actually becomes Minkowski space-time uh, to the spatial infinity uh, then we can actually obtain a well well-defined notion of energy which also has the properties that we would expect of energy and uh, so yes I mean it's conserved uh, with this evolution with the with the evolution of the system and what has been actually only recent well relatively recently proven it actually is positive uh, this this definition of energy takes into account just the total energy within this isolated gravitating system so both the energy contained in this in the gravitational uh, in the gravitational field and in the matter fields and uh, yes, it is positive. And actually, if it is equal to zero, then that means that the space time that we're examining is just a flat, empty space, just just simple Minkowski. Uh, so 
it's nice to be able to define the energy of an isolated gravitating system, but unfortunately this definition has some very stringent uh, requirements to be actually put to use and just this and uh, yeah this the, the, this isolation of a system is a thing that's hard to actually realize in real life uh, because to define the energy of uh, of a spacetime we needed to approach the Minkowski metric at infinity and unfortunately the spacetime uh, we know which can roughly be what you know our spacetime that we live in it well somehow resembles the friedman lemaitre robbins robertson walker metric which is uh, not not asymptotically flat it does not approach minkowski at infinity so actually the total energy of our spacetime is not well defined <laughs> okay <clears throat> so uh, so to do that, we would actually be we want to be able to, uh, yeah, somehow to 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 find a well def, uh, well defined notion of energy for a finite region of space time, and but uh, we have to realize that actually to define uh, an energy for a finite region of space time, we need to make some arbitrary choices. It's unavoidable because if we have this this region of interest and we choose some evolution, uh, then we, op we can obtain, yes, the, the, this notion of, of, of this generating function, the Hamiltonian or energy. But if we choose a different way of evolving, our, just a different direction in time of evolving our system, we may obtain, we probably will obtain a different value of the Hamiltonian. And since it's general relativity and space is not, is not flat and there is no actually, there is no way to actually compare uh this these directions at different points on the boundary then just we can choose some other some wild way of evolving and it's actually hard to tell which way is which way is wild and which is not wild <clears throat> but perhaps uh, some suggestion at what way of choosing this this boundary can be sensible uh, of, 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 of which way of choosing this, this evolution trajectory is sensible, uh, can be obtained from the very bound, again, just from by looking at the boundary. Uh, if we start with a simple example, just uh, look at a flat space-like slice of the Minkowski uh, metric, then we have a well-defined preferred uh, direction of time, which is just perpendicular to this to the space-time slice. And, but now if we just have this bare two-dimensional uh, surface in some general space-time, we can actually find a preferred direction of time at every point of this two-dimensional uh, two surface. And we can do that by means of an uh, object called the mean curvature. Uh, Roughly speaking, this mean curvature can be understood as a gradient of this uh, of the area uh, of the two-dimensional surface uh, in the directions perpendicular to this to this boundary surface. So if this if this vector is uh, so yeah, this vector belongs is just a, a vector perpendicular to the two-dimensional surface, and if it is space-like, then we can find, uh, then by just choosing another direction that is perpendicular to this mean curvature, we obtain a space-like direction uh, at each point on the boundary. So we could use this, yeah, the, 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 this property of, of mean curvature of a surface to determine to, to, to make a choice of the evolution uh, just to, just of the yeah, to make a choice of time evolution but again if we choose some wild two-dimensional surface it may turn out that we obtain a very strange a very strange distribution of these time directions on the surface and uh, well, of course we can still define a generating function uh, for such 
strange evolution trajectory, but we have no guarantee of, of the properties that such an evol evolution functions would have. We don't know if it, if it would be positive definite. Uh, yeah, we don't know if it would be actually, well, what, what do we know? Yeah, went away. <sighs> it could behave in a very unexpected way. Uh, so the thing is that perhaps just asking for a well-defined notion of energy just for every two any two-dimensional surface uh, in the in the space-time is just asking for a bit too much. So perhaps we can just uh, restrict ourselves to some nice surfaces which give us a sensible set of time evolution. And uh, one way that we can characterize such surfaces is uh, just uh, is a way that was developed by uh, Professor Stiewski and Jezierski. It's called so-called rigid sphere conditioned. Yes, since I see I'm a bit low on time, so uh, a rough summary of that slide. Uh, for any two-dimensional space-like surface, there is a way to define uh, a notion of spherical harmonics on such a surface. Uh, that, it won't really matter for us that much how can we do that, but we can do that. And uh, if we have this notion of uh, harmonics, uh, then we can look at this, at this mean curvature of this two-dimensional surface and the torsion of this two-dimensional surface. And uh, so, so this, this extrinsic torsion of the two-dimensional surface more or less tells us how this bundle of uh, of vectors perpendicular to the surface behave when we move over the surface. But anyway, uh, just these uh, these equations allow us to characterize uh, a surface that is somehow well behaved. The thing is that uh, these equations in Minkowski spacetime they give us just the normal set of round uh, space-like spheres. And, but, but they're actually uh, not too restrictive. So if we are in some general space-time, but that is close enough to the Minkowski metric, it still possesses a solution, uh, an eight uh, parameter so solution, family of solutions uh, of spheres, which somehow, we, which we can somehow say, resemble these nice round spheres in the Minkowski space-time. Uh, so now I will pass to the uh, linearized uh, gravity. So to be very brief, uh, we can perform a linearization of, of, of Einstein equations. And uh, uh, yes, and just to, 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 to give some, yes, yeah, so we can perform this, this linearization, for example, on the spherically symmetric uh, background of the Schwarz-Desitter metric. Uh, that's, in general, just a uh, uh, Minkowski or a Desitter spacetime with a black hole in the center. Uh, so it turns out that if we have a linearized gravitational field on such a background, then it can actually be described by just uh, four degrees of freedom. And these, three, uh, these four degrees of freedom, uh, well, they have uh, a well-defined supplect. Just, just we can obtain the, the, the supplectic form of the theory in of the linearized theory in terms of these four degrees of freedom. Uh, and from the symplectic form, we can actually obtain, uh, in a canonical way, a Hamiltonian function that governs the evolution. Uh, you can say that, wait a second, I mean, a moment ago I said that we need to choose a time direction for to define energy, and now I'm saying that we somehow have a canonical notion of energy. So, um, yeah, simply when we just, uh, well, we have chosen uh, <coughs> just um, in, uh, yeah, in this formula, in, in the formulation here, uh, we've, we have actually chosen just, just uh, this this cano uh, canonical 
time direction uh, on this in this in this space time just by performing just by because actually we had to just we separated our space, sliced our space time into uh, well into somehow the natural space like surfaces in this uh, in this this iterative metric and naturally we have we have this once we've performed this foliation with space time slices then what follows is also the, the time direction, just the time evolution between these slices. So we have a well-defined notion of this energy of the linearized gravitational field. But what should be noted that actually it turns out that this Hamiltonian is not local. It also is an, uh, just the expression for, for this Hamiltonian. Also, it does not make sense to, to, to compute it at, at a single point. We need to have knowledge of uh, of just of some uh, yes, of some extended part. Uh, I just we have to have the knowledge of how this linearized field looks in some extended part of the space time to actually be able to 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 uh, to compute this H invariant. So now. Uh, when we when we go back to the full nonlinear theory, uh, we would like to know. Uh, I mean, and we have some. Well, let's say we have just some notion of energy. We, we we propose some definition of energy for a region of space time, and we we want to know whether it makes sense. So the, a natural test that comes to mind would be to compare it uh, with the energy defin with with the well known energy for the gravita for the linearized gravitational field. Is our non full nonlinear expression for energy approximated by the energy of the linear linear field? And it turns out, for example, that for the HDM mass, the HDM mass is indeed approximated by this linearized field, field Hamiltonian. So any sensible quasi-local energy candidate should always fulfill a similar property. Uh, so as a main result of my PhD thesis, I actually investigated whether the Hawking energy definition fulfills uh, this criterion. And uh, well, that's the expression for the Hawking energy. Uh, and uh, well, that, that's perhaps a very abstract, in a very abstract form. Uh, a more practical approach is that uh, these, uh, this expression here uh, can actually be transformed into a, a product of uh, expansion coefficients for the line codes for the ingoing and outgoing light cones on this uh, just on this boundary surface s uh, so so this Hawking energy can somehow be measured by looking at how light is bent by the yes on the on the surface uh, on this boundary surface of our region and uh, Yes, the, the, the choice for the Hawking energy, why did I investigate the Hawking energy? It's, well, because we can actually quite easily calculate something in that, in just in this example, because it's actually possible just to express Hawking energy by an integral in the interior of this boundary surface, and as an integral of this, just on some hypersurface spanning the, our boundary of the region. <coughs> and... Uh, this this integral can then be approximate we can calculate the approximation of this integral to the second order and what we obtain is the following expression uh so so there's that that's good news we already there's this this hamiltonian of linearized field appears naturally when we perform this calculation and uh, then there are some leftover parts uh, so the first leftover part uh, can be just removed by an appropriate choice uh, of the radial coordinate, so we don't worry about that. Uh, the second part actually we see is an expression in the field variables, uh, which is uh, actually something that we would expect, uh, because this, this expression simply tells us uh, how we control this, this expression tells us about the control of interaction uh, of uh, 
yeah, of the system contained within our boundary with the outside world. Uh, so, so just this this expression just exp yeah, expresses the, the fact that we need to, to to control this interaction somehow, and the, the control needs to be can be performed just by fixing, for example, the, the value of these degrees of freedom y and x on the boundary uh, of our region. And then the last part, well, uh, the last part is actually gauge dependent. So we could just wave it off as well since so, so, so some gauge remnant, but actually uh, it turns out that it is it can be uh, that that this expression can actually be uh, put into a form in which it it is just an expression in the linearizations of uh, the rigid sphere condition that I mentioned er earlier in some miraculous way. Uh, from this calculation, we obtained a linearized form of these conditions for a well-behaved round sphere in a space-time. Uh, so yeah, that, that was actually a big surprise to, <laughs> to all of us. And so, so in this way, if we, 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 we can say that just we see that the Hawking mass that indeed does satisfy this, this criterion for a sensible candidate uh, for a quasi uh, for a quasi local mass. And just uh, to sum up a few key points, so there is no local energy uh, density for the gravitational field. Uh, we can uh, we know a uh, well defined and well established expression for the energy of the on a linearized gravitational field and it can serve as a criterion for the nonlinear energy candidates. Uh, and such criterion is satisfied by the Hawking quasi-local mass under certain conditions, which turn out to correspond in some way to these rigid sphere conditions. So that is a suggestion. It's, well, it's not a very strict statement since, again, those are gauge, uh, gauge parts, but they bear a striking, striking resemblance to this rigid sphere condition, so they suggest that perhaps, uh, perhaps just this, this indeed this sensible definition of energy is only applicable to a well defined to some well behaved surfaces. So that concludes the first part of my talk, and uh, well, I see that I'm almost out of time already. Uh, so perhaps uh, I'll so 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 for the second part i'll just try to to run through the well theory and go to the uh, to the jokes and uh so uh so just uh so actually my 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 job right now is in a something called quantitative risk support uh section of the bank uh well okay it actually has many names i'm not sure what it's called right now it changed over time but out of many names just my department had, the quantitative risk support is kind of best, I think best explanatory. And more or less, we're just uh, helping the bank uh, fulfill the, uh, just its obligation to uh, just of some, as its regulatory obligations, because just uh, people, well, uh, to, to give a bit of history, uh, well, uh, there's such a thing as BCBS, bank Basel, Basel Committee for, uh, for banking supervisions and just important people from important countries meet there and uh, well give suggestions on what to do uh, to, to avoid such situations as the economic crisis in 2008 and 2009 when banks suddenly suddenly ran out of money so in general for the banks not to run, not to run out of money uh, banks need to keep some capital in their back pockets just to be able to pay up if their if their investments fail, and uh, so banks need but banks need to calculate how much money they need to keep in their back pocket just to be safe, and they need to tell from time to time uh, to the supervisors of the state, just uh, of the countries that the bank is lo located in. I mean, how much money. So, so from time to time, just banks need to tell the, the, these supervisors how much money they need to, to, to be safe with their operations and uh, and tell them that they actually do have this money. <laughs> uh, so actually, well, my job is a kind of a 
so team that supports the, pro, the, the models uh, that are used to calculate the, the, this capital required. Uh, so in general, we're kind of in the middle between the people who actually run the, the computers which calculate the stuff and the people who actually look at the market and just make some market decisions. So we're supposed to both know how the computers work and know how the market works. And uh, one of such way of measuring the possible loss, uh, just a metric used to, 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 to calculate this regulatory capital is so-called the so-called value at risks. And uh, more or less, it tells you uh, what, how much money you will lose just at, uh, well, if the situation is not worse than this alpha percentage. It's probably best to understand while looking at this, mm, at this distribution, that's the distribution of profits and losses, for example, of a bank portfolio. Axis, PNL, it stands for profit and loss. So we have, for example, let's say that I have just uh, an uh, yes, I mean, I mean the, this can be I, I mean this X can be anything, but yes, in general, it's supposed to be calculated for the whole wallet of the bank. So that's when the trouble comes in because we can we don't actually have a, a well defined you know just this this theoretical distribution for some stuff because some investments of the bank, uh, for example, have non non linear reactions to the movements of the market and stuff like that. And uh, well, there are over half a million of some small parts that come together <laughs> into this X for the whole bank. So the, the, there's a big issue of how to actually how you're supposed to calculate it. And, uh, and Monte Carlo is actually the way <laughs> that is most commonly used to calculate such stuff. But Monte Carlo or historical, you can just look at somehow historical movements of the market and then use them to calculate how much your portfolio will move in value and then look what's the cutoff <laughs> uh, at some set level of probability uh, but well it's ge in general it's well it's a non not necessary not very sophisticated probability calculus but a technological challenge actually just to to, to be able to, to to monitor this hundreds and of thousands of thousands uh, of just market parameters, which and somehow model their movements to predict what's the chance, just and, and, and how this how this will move. So yeah, I mean it's uh, okay. So just to 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 give a bit of personal reflections uh, about that. <laughs> uh, so so the, the first thing I learned when I was looking for a job. <laughs> just to, to try something out of the academia. Uh, I learned, I wanted to, well, I was looking for something uh, a bit different, but still uh, I would, I think, thought that it would be a good idea to, to actually put some, well, mathematical agility that I've acquired to some use. So of course I uh, pursued job offers with, which contained the strong analytical skills requirement. And I soon <laughs> learned that this means more or less that you can actually open Excel and more or less understand what's written inside. <laughs> uh, it was a bit of a yeah, disillusionary experience, <laughs> experience in that regard. Uh, but then, uh, well, just perhaps an, an, an interesting observation in that regard is just, uh, uh, I learned not to get disheartened <laughs> when looking for this job, uh, because out of all the CVs I've sent to various places, um, the response rate was more or less on the uh, level of 10%. And well, the job I actually uh, acquired, uh, the, the, the job I got, uh, I sent my CVs uh, to several other well, banks mostly, or, or some uh, consulting uh, companies. Uh, for well, for just just for, for for jobs, for very similar jobs, but actually I usually didn't even get a chance to to actually somehow you know 
present my ability to anyone. So, so I mean, only just this 10% uh, of this of these applications I actually had a chance to talk face to face with somebody and not somehow get just somewhat blindly eliminated in the earlier part of the procedure. Well, uh, that was not uh, the, the, the next point. There's a lot of mathematicians and physicists in the financial industry. It's kind of obvious, but right now I've verified it experimentally. <laughs> it's like uh, just a, a manager from a, from a team next to me is also worked at, obviously in general relativity, actually. <laughs> uh my director did some fluid dynamics <laughs> and uh the first guy that i that that actually interviewed me uh for 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 another position but but also at citibank uh just graduated from the mathematics at the warsaw university so <laughs> so it's a small world in that regard and uh, in the end i actually that that was a good opportunity to to also do this looking for a job to actually just learn some stochastic calculus which i always was always interested in but never actually had the time just to to indulge in that stuff and uh yeah uh what abilities from this academic life actually can be transferred to to to, to such to to to, to such a financial industry uh well considering mathematics it's mostly probabilistic probability calculus i mean yeah, in general, model, modeling some random, random movements and stuff. Obviously, this 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 higher just this higher mathematics is not necessarily applicable applicable in that regard. Uh, <sighs> yes, so uh, just I actually recall a, a statement which I heard during one of the interviews uh from from yeah uh from a physicist working in this industry just don't worry it's only simple mathematics here just some multivariate uh probability distributions nothing harder than that so, yeah uh another well a soft skill uh from the academia which is very useful uh especially in, in the international in the multinational companies it's exposures to very different flavors of english yes you just as at the conferences, we learn to understand uh, English, oh, how differently English is spoken by different nationalities. So obviously, if you can understand a, a conference talk, then you can also understand what your colleagues are actually speaking. Since <laughs> uh, even, even actually currently in, in the Warsaw team, uh, half the people are from Italy for some reason. Uh, yes, another thing that's common is the programming skills. And uh, it turns out that both from the place I work at and when I just talk with some friends of mine, it's Python is currently just uh, the top of the top uh, in popularity. And uh, finally, actually, some writing skills are uh, just skills for writing some, you know, uh, when you write some science, scientific papers, just this abilities takes uh, actually is quite useful when you for example need to write some documentation of some mathematical model but also sometimes in a way that would actually make it understandable to, to people who possibly are a bit less versed in the mathematics so yeah those were all of just the thoughts i wanted to share thank you for your attention <laughs> thank you so actually we're running out of time, but still I think that we have time for like one or two questions, but then we can continue because if we have more questions to Piotr, we can go upstairs and eat some cake. Yeah, there were cookies actually. Cookies. <laughs> okay, but let's start and that was the first one. I would like to ask something about the second part of your talk. I mean, obviously you develop some technology to control this risk to manage this risk or to provide information, select information for managers. Now, my question is how, what is your estimate? How diverse is this technology in the industry, in the whole banking sector? Isn't that like that, that every bank actually runs the same program? And therefore it, there is a danger that they either uh, misjudge the situation or overlook and mm. create a, a, a turmoil on the market. Well, uh... I, th 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 there might be 
some some parts of the process that yeah could could could, could be at such risk that there's some crucial point from which everyone uh which everyone uses uh I, well, I'm not, I don't know about the internal technology of different banks, but one thing is data collection. How, where do banks get uh, historical data to then be able to somehow model the way the market moves? And that's just, the, this, this data is provided by some companies like Bloomberg, for example. And uh, just some, some, some just web portals. And uh, yeah, I would guess that more or less everyone in the in the industry just takes this data from really not that diverse num really not that big number of data providers so obviously if there's something wrong with the data they provide then everyone is in the wrong okay so now quick question of kuba and which doesn't mean that our money is safe. <laughs> uh, so last week I read an article in Nature about an avalanche of scientists, or of mid-career scientists living at academia. And the three major factors that made them leave were, quote, toxic work environments, bullying, and a lack of regard for their safety and well-being. Uh, have those three factors affected you before you you took the decision of leaving academia that's my first question and the other one is um how do you perceive the level of toxicity in your current workplace compared to academia <laughs> okay uh, can i answer that anonymously <laughs> yes but uh actually yeah, I don't really think that I, uh, well, I was lucky in that regard. Uh, I don't think I had a chance to, to, to experience such, <laughs> any such situations firsthand. And uh, also, to be honest, I'm not a very observant person when it comes to my surroundings. So I'm not aware, of, so also I'm not aware of anything happening around me in that regard. <laughs> and uh, well, about my uh, current, uh, Yes, uh, my current uh, workplace. Yeah, I'm also lucky here because, well, I mean, first of all, also I don't really see such such situations, uh, at least in my vicinity. But also, I I think that I had a yeah, I was a bit of lucky to to land in a position which is not really under that much stress comparatively to some other parts uh of the bank because since we're just doing this you know this regulatory process uh, i mean the deadlines are usually quite long and the, the, there are r rarely just some forest fires occurs when we when we just need to to run and do this today and best and best yesterday right so so probably it's also uh, well so, so, so that also contributes to the fact that probably such such situations are not really prone to arise in such environments so. <laughs> yeah it's not that bad <laughs> okay i think we have to stop <laughs> and then we'll continue upstairs sure, so yeah. one will <laughs> like to okay.